Come Holy Spirit I will forever need Thee Yes, please come Holy Spirit, I pray. Oh, please come in thy strength and thy great power. Oh, yes, come in thine own gentle way. There is absolutely nothing like the moving of the undefinable, unexplainable Spirit of God. It separates the earthy from the heavenly, the mundane, or the miraculous from the mundane. It separates the Christ from the carnal. A short time ago, we were in South Africa in Crusades. We were in the city of Durban for this particular meeting. The, we were in an outdoor stadium. All that day it had rained. I remember pacing the floor, asking God to hold back the rain that we could have church that night. It rained right up until 7.30 and stopped. Thousands upon thousands, in spite of the inclement weather, not knowing if they would have to set out in the open or not, had gathered. Thousands more trying to get in from the outside, unable to, because the place had been filled. That night, God's Spirit moved in one of those ways that you don't forget. Many, many, many lives were changed. Many souls were saved. But something happened in that service. I had just gotten up from the piano. The music part of the service had concluded. And instantly a lady, a man, I'm sorry, somewhere in that vast audience of multiple thousands gave an utterance in tongues. Somewhere in the congregation, I never could find where she was, a lady interpreted it. And in spite of it being a huge place, much larger than this, seating many more people, her voice was crystal clear as it rang out in the night air. And what I'm about to say is not spectacular. But it was that night. In the course of the interpretation, one line was like copious showers. It said, every precious drop of the blood of Jesus. And when that word was uttered, it hit that congregation. There must have been two or three hundred Africans sitting on the front that could not speak nor understand English. They didn't understand what she said, but the power of God hit them, and grown men sat there and shook. It was a portend of what would happen in the altar service. Hundreds walked those grassy corridors to come to Jesus Christ. This service tonight can only be what it must be with His Spirit. No other way. We've got one of the finest teams in the world, we think. But without his spirit, they're nothing. I prepare, I study, but without his spirit, I can do nothing. That's the reason I say, come, Holy Spirit, yes, I need thee. 
Oh, please come. Holy Spirit, I pray. Yes, please come in thy strength and thy loving power. Oh, please come in thine own gentle way. Could you stand please all over this audience and sing it? Come, Holy Spirit, I need Sing it again, everybody. Come on, Texas. Let thy spirit mix and mingle with his spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, I need thee. Come, Holy Spirit, I pray. Come in thy strength and thy power. Come in thine own dream. Sing it one more time. As this entire audience sings it by television, let His Spirit flow through your soul. I need Thee. Lift your hands and worship Him. Praise Him and adore Him and thank Him. Glory be to that mighty name of Jesus. Praise the holy name of the Lord. Just worship Him. Just praise Him. Just adore Him. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah.
we lift up your voices and sing it now. He is Lord. He is Worship Him. Tell Him you love Him. Praise Him. He's worthy of all praise. He's our great Redeemer. He's our wondrous Redeemer. He's our magnificent Redeemer. He's Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the fairest of ten thousands, the bright and the morning star. Blessed be His holy, precious name. All over this building, I want you to take your time from the top to the bottom to the sides. And I want you to get the biggest smile on your face because the child of God is the only one in the world that has anything to smile about. And I want you to turn around, shake hands, hug necks, tell these folk you're so glad to see them here tonight all over the building. It's glory, 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 the hallelujah, hallelujah, since I've laid, since I've laid, my burdens down, my burdens down, well, glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Since I've laid, since I've laid my burdens down. Well, yes, I'm feeling, yes, I'm feeling so much better, so much better since I've laid, since I've laid my burdens down, my burdens down. I said, I'm feeling, yes, I'm feeling so much better, so much better. Since I've laid, oh, since I've laid my burdens down, it's glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Since I've laid, since I've laid my burdens down, my burdens down, my glory, 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 glory.
Praise the Lord. 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 <laughs> Sit down. Well, hallelujah. I'm so glad to see you tonight. I want you to know I'm expecting an old-fashioned, Holy Ghost, heaven-sent gully washer tonight. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, the devil is going to limp for a month after last night. Mm. Oh, we had church. We have church. Once you've been in the presence of God, you'll never be satisfied anymore with old cold, dead, dry, liturgical, formalistic religion. <laughs> Glory. <laughs> so we welcome you tonight, whomever you may be. I, we're going to treat you in so many ways, you're bound to like some of them. And we're here for one purpose, and that's to bless you. Okay. <laughs> well, you, you, how you doing tonight? You gonna wave at the folk? Wave at them? We'll say something. This is Gabriel Lee, the drums. Oh, he wants the drums. <laughs> and he can't understand why he, you know, his grandpa, his papa can give him anything in the world, he thinks. So he just can't understand why he can't go play the drums. A little bit later, now, can you get your little sister, your big sister to come out here? Can you? Could you do that? She's, she's not coming. All righty. Well, okay, your baby brother's home in Baton Rouge. Now, will you, will you wave at him? Bye-bye. Wave bye-bye. Wave bye-bye. We've practiced it all week. <laughs> <laughs> he knows what he wants. <laughs> I, I've got to say this to you. I, I've, I don't really have to say it in that sense, but I say it because I, I've just got to in my heart. I want to. We, the, the greater Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, I don't care who you are, what church you belong to, or maybe a lot of you do not belong to any church, but whomever, wherever, whatever, I've just got to tell you, we love you, and I mean that. You've been so very, very kind to us through the years. We consider it a distinct honor and privilege and pleasure to be here in this great, great, great Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. And just allow me to say that to you, that we deeply appreciate you. Love every one of you. As far as I'm concerned, as we have a little saying in Louisiana, you're the pick of the litter. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, God love your heart so much. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Praise the name of Jesus. I want to reach way back tonight. I'll confess something to you, and you probably have wondered. Maybe you've not thought about it at all. Probably not. I, I stay so busy that I don't have the time to learn a lot of new songs like I'd like to. And... Some of the new ones don't fit me. I'll be honest with you. I can't relate to them. I, I, these that go way back and really... And I'm not implying that there are no good new ones. There are. 
But I pray this one will be a blessing to you. How long has it been? Since you've talked the law and told him your heart's hidden secret, how long since you prayed? How long since you've stayed on your knees? Till the light shone through How long has it been Since your mind felt at ease How long since your heart knew no burden you call him your friend how long has it been since you knew that he cared Since you've knelt by your bed You've just stopped and you prayed to the Lord Up in heaven How long since you knew That he would answer you And he would keep you the long night through How long has it been since you woke with the dawn and felt that the day was worth Can you call him your friend? How long has it been since you knew that he cared for you? that you're saved here tonight. You know it by the help and grace of God. Thomas, come on and sing it for us. I know, I know, I know. Some people say that this old time religion well, it's just a thing of the past Oh, but in this modern age 
that we are living You know it's the only thing That will last Now you You may say That I'm a little old-fashioned Well, friend That's all right with me Cause I'm so glad That I Christian oh, yes. oh, yeah. and from sin I have been set free Was real everywhere. Now that the load that I carry is lighter and he's changed my gray skies to blue. My steps are now higher, for I have his assurance that his sweet love will carry me through. I look and see Earth's golden riches The hoarding mark So much selfish gain The taller
It's harvest time Harvest time The Savior's calling The grain It's growing late. Oh, the fields are wide. It's harvest Before my maker I'll have to give account Of what I've done I want more than anything in this world To hear him say to me Well done, my servant. You are crown of life. Turn your darkness, turn your darkness into. 
the day. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. I now can say. Sitting at the right hand of the Father. Hallelujah, hallelujah. He's interceding for us right now. I'm not talking about this love that people play with. I'm talking about a true love. The love that gets down in your heart. Oh, and makes you want to shout sometimes. Oh, and makes you want to say hallelujah. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. I'm talking about the love of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. That kind of love will roll. clouds away Jesus, oh, Master, 
my Savior, my Lord, my King, my Rock, my open door, my beginning and my ending, my Lord, my King, my Savior, my Jesus. the name of Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. You may be seated. Closing this part of the service tonight, thank God the battle is over. It is finished. Ladies and gentlemen, John Starn. There's a line that's drawn through the ages. On that line stands an old rugged cross. On that cross, On that cross. a battle is raging. For the gain of man's soul or its loss The earth shakes with the force of the conflict And the sun refuses to shine For there hangs God's Son in the balance And then through the darkness He cries It is finished The battle It is finished yes, it is. And Jesus is Lord Still in my heart The battle was raging And not all prisoners of war Had come home There were battlefields of my own making. Yes, I did not know that the war had been won. Then I heard that the king of the ages he had fought all the battles for you and me and 
and that victory was ours for the claiming. And now, praise his name, I'm free. It is finished, it's finished, the battle. Just raise your hands and praise him because Jesus Christ is Lord. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is Lord. Praise the name of Jesus. Glory be to that mighty, holy, precious name. Hallelujah to the Christ. Thank you, John. If you have your Bibles tonight, turn with me, please, to the book of 2 Kings, reading from the fifth chapter. Starting with the first verse, Second Kings chapter 5, verse 1, the Bible says, Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable. Because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Hebrews 12 and 1. The writings of the Apostle Paul, 12th chapter, 1st verse. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. I want to use for a subject tonight words that at first hearing would sound and seem somewhat strange. But I think it is apropos, will be appropriate for this message that I believe God has given me. The subject, that thing. That thing. Would you bow your heads? Heavenly Father, help us tonight. For the millions of people that will view by television, May thy spirit under the great anointing flow into their hearts and into their lives. I would ask, dear God, that this message that I think is one of the most important you've ever given me would affect deliverance not only for many here in this Colosseum in Dallas that need it, but so many by television that need it. Let thy word go forth, and it shall not 
return to thee void. I do not ask for the plaudits of my most esteemed brethren. I do not ask for the accolades of the crowd. But I simply ask that I may be a channel through which thy spirit may flow tonight. And I'll ask it all in the name of Jesus. And everyone said amen and amen. That thing. I possibly will say some things tonight that some of you have never heard before behind a pulpit. I do not know if they shall fall into the category of controversy or not. Possibly so. The subject that I believe the Holy Spirit has dealt with me to deliver is a very delicate subject. If God helps me, it will uncover that which Satan has so successfully covered in the hearts and the lives of many of God's children, that thing. When you read that first verse of that fifth chapter of 2 Kings, it is almost like reading words pertaining to a child of God. The Bible said that he was a mighty man. Many of you that sat before me tonight and many of you by television, through Jesus Christ, it could be said of you that you are mighty. That would not be an exaggerative statement. And the Bible said he was a great man with his master. So many of whom I will speak tonight, strangely and oddly enough, are great with their master, and I speak of the Lord. The Bible said he was honorable. Many of those of which I speak this evening, that word could even be used of them, honorable. The Bible said he had given deliverance to Syria, and it's a strange thing, but many deliverance men need deliverance themselves. It's an oddity. It's almost a misnomer, but it's true. The Bible said he was a mighty man in valor. That's a word that we don't hear too much nowadays because not many fall into this category. But that word could be said of so many Christians, men of valor, individuals that are totally consecrated and dedicated, but yet the Bible closes this passage with the words, but he was a leper. I have a dear friend, he's not an American, does not live on this continent, many years my senior. God has used him remarkably so, certain parts of the world, to bring deliverance to many, to see multiplicities of people saved by the blood of Jesus, so many filled with the Holy Spirit. He said God gave him a vision once, and yet it was a strange vision. I know him well. I've known him for over 20 years, and I believe that God gave it to him. I will go further than that. I will say, I know God gave it to him, and this is the vision. I will make it brief. In his native country, he went into a particular village. The place was strange to him. The people were strangers. He saw a man and his wife that were surrounded by children, and they seemed to be enjoying these children immensely. He casually made mention to the man standing by his side that these people, this couple, had beautiful children. The man said, yes, they are, but they are not the children of, the, of that couple. That couple has no children. They love children more than life. They've wanted children more than anything else. But they have had to realize their fulfillment by enjoying the children of others. 
The question was casually asked, why cannot they have children? The man shrugged his shoulders, said, I do not know. And in the vision, he said, there are rumors, but no one knows. But we know that these are precious people loved all over this town. It was strange. A few moments later, he happened to speak to another individual, and the, he made mention of the couple that were enjoying the company of these children, and he said, they tell me these children do not belong to this couple. They said, that's right. They tell me that they cannot have children of their own. That is correct. Do you know why they cannot have children of their own? They must seek fulfillment and completion by enjoying the offspring of others. The man said, I do not know. I've heard stories, but I, I don't know. No one here knows except one man. An African that lives at the edge of the village, he is said to know, he's aged in years, the reason that this couple has no children. According to directions, he went to this man. His interest, curiosity aroused. He found that his name was Majuba, which is in Afrikaans means dove. After opening the conversation with the aged African, he said, They tell me that this couple in the village that loves the company of children so much but yet has none of their own, that you know the reason that they do not have any and cannot have any and have to seek their fulfillment with the issue of others. He said, Yes, I do know. He said, well, will you tell me? He said, no, I will not. I will tell, I will not tell you. I have never told anyone. It will go down to the grave with me. He said, I don't understand. What is it? He said, the only thing I will say it is that thing. The problem of Christians today with that thing within their lives that's eating the very core of their spirit is almost legend in number. Satan seeks for a handhold in the life of a child of God. He seeks for a place of weakness. And no sin is pretty. All sin is ugly. But he wants to bind you with the most hideous, the most darkened and deadly and dastardly of sin. I was in a certain city not long ago in crusade. Telephone rang. I answered it. A young man told me, he said, Brother Swaggart, I was in the crusade last night. He went on to say some nice things about the meeting, and then he told me this, and I could feel the pathos within his voice. He said, I have got to have help. If I don't receive help, I am going to kill myself. I could tell from the tone of the voice that he was not some individual possessed by paranoia. I knew that the situation was critical and the psychiatrists tell us if an individual talks about this enough, you better take them seriously for they mean it. I said, are you saved? He said, yes, I'm saved. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I love God with all of my heart. But there is something in my life that I can't quit. There's something there that is eating my insides out. It is killing me. I have tried to quit. I have shed enough tears before God. My heart has been broken countless times. I have 
begged him to forgive me over and over again, and he has. But I feel so dirty, I have no respect for myself, and I cannot go on any longer. I'm going to end my life. I can't stand it. I said, young man, what is it? He said, Brother Swaggart, I've never told anyone. There is no one that knows that there is not an individual in the world. I go to church. I sit there. I, I, I believe I'm as dedicated as an individual can be. But there is something that has gripped me inside that thing. And he spilled it out. He said, it's pornography and masturbation, sexual uncleanliness, and I cannot go on any longer. I'm going to shock you tonight, but what I say is true. How many Christians? How many of you that watch me by television, you love God? Now let me say this. We hear the term hypocrites used, and there are a few hypocrites in the church, but I believe there aren't many. I believe that most Christians, be they weak, be they unknowledgeable, be they not much knowing the Word of God, be whatever problem it is, most down deep inside want to serve God. They may fail, they may stumble, they may not know as much as you do, but I believe most people want to serve God, and I don't believe there are many, I'm talking about in the church, that they're using their, their, their so-called salvation or religion as a facade or a cloak to hide the evil intent inside with no desire really to live for Jesus. It's just a joke. I don't believe there are many like that. It's too serious a business. But how many at this moment, Christians, You've been saved by the blood of Jesus. Some even filled with the Holy Spirit. But they are drinking secretly on the side. No one knows it. They never intended for it to get this far. Little by little it goes deeper and deeper. They are hooked now. They, they, they shudder. They, they, when the preacher speaks out against alcoholic beverage, they're the first one to shout. But they are drinking every day. How many are like that? I do not say this with a condemnatory, sarcastic attitude. You've got enough problems without Jimmy Swaggart hitting you over the head or hindering you or hurting you. I say it as a matter of truth. How many Christians at this moment are cut to pieces inside. Little by little, they've gone deeper and deeper. And some of you would look at me here tonight and say, Jimmy Swaggart, it's not possible for a person to be saved and filled with the Holy Spirit and have something like this or what you've mentioned a moment ago. Wait before you judge. I don't care what a person has done. I don't even care how many times they've done it as bad as it is and that of course would have limitations I don't care how despicable and dirty and dark and dastardly it may be if that individual goes to God with a sincere earnest repentant heart and says God I am sorry for what I have done would you please forgive me this book tells us that God will hear that prayer and will forgive and cleanse that sin and wash it away. And there are thousands of Christians, many of you but television, that are living a life of constant repentance. It's a constant scenario of repentance most of the time, these people are consecrated. They're dedicated to God. But Satan has found that place there. They're going deeper and deeper. They have little or no respect for themselves. Satan feeds them the lie, telling them it's no use. They might as well quit and give it all up and just go on out into the depths of sin, turn their back on God and the church. He'll tell you you're a hypocrite or you're blaspheming the Holy Ghost or you're demon-possessed or whatever he can get you to believe. 
as you go deeper and deeper. Wanting to quit, trying to quit, but somehow you haven't found the lock on the door. I'm going to say something tonight that I believe God has given me. This sin or these sins could cover a gamut from A to Z. The list is almost endless. But the spirit of this age, that is the most pronounced diabolical scheme of hell in the world today is the spirit of sexual uncleanness or sexual promiscuity. It is so rampant that it runs like a sewer through the very mainstream of our culture. It has bound up the hearts, the lives of millions of people today. I spoke to one of the world's most powerful entertainers some time ago as the Spirit of God dealt greatly with him. And when I got to the core of the thing, he had suffered untold agony and trouble. He had suffered enough chaos for a hundred lives and I was pleading with him and begging him to come to Jesus. But when I got to the bottom of it, I found that it was sexual filth and perversion that he did not want to give up. That was what stopped him. That spirit that is gripping the lives, pornography, these filthy movies, perversion, adultery, fornication, God help us, Jimmy Swagger, are you telling me that a Christian, a child of God could be involved in, in this unmitigated filth of hell? That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. You say, that, that's, that's, that's horrible. I know it's horrible. But you would be surprised. These rotten sins that are so hellish, they stagger the imagination. God has things to say about them, but he also has things to say about other sins. He said that jealousy is as, is as cruel as the grave. He said that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. He said that he hates pride more than he hates anything else. So no sin is pretty. All sin is ugly and destructive and damnable. But this spirit of the age that's always been here, but I believe more pronounced today than ever before, is the sin of sexual filth. That makes it imperative, church of the living God, for you to conduct yourselves pure and holy, walking straight and clean and true as an example of righteousness in the midst of a filthy and profligate age. <laughs> Ladies, please listen to me. I do not speak to the world. I do not speak to those that do not know God. I do not speak to those that have no knowledge of Jesus Christ, but I speak to the body of Christ irrespective of what church that you may be associated with. Ladies, your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. Mothers, teach your daughters that shorts are wrong. Teach your daughters to dress decently. Teach your daughters that their bodies are temples of the Holy Ghost. For we are living in an age when Satan is taking advantage as he has never taken advantage before to destroy by these evils that I have mentioned the lives of millions today, including Christians. I want to tell you of some Bible characters that you would never dream that had these problems. Bible doesn't really name all of them, but it names some of them. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 5 through 7, Isaiah saw the Lord and said, Woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. 
Then flew one of the seraphims to me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Isaiah, the great prophet of God. You see, preachers are not immune from these problems either. That's the reason you ought to pray for your pastors constantly. They are targets for the powers of hell. Satan is, is gunning for them to destroy them completely. Here is Isaiah that spoke greatly and glowingly of the virgin birth. Here is Isaiah that spoke more of the great millennial reign that is to come than any other prophet that ever lived. Here is mighty Isaiah, and he said, Woe is me! You stand tonight and ask, What was his sin? I don't know. The Holy Spirit did not desire that it be uncovered. The Holy Ghost hushed it up and just used the word iniquity and sin. But that thing was in Isaiah's life. That thing thing was there until the Spirit of God broke the bondage of that darkness. We look tonight at Job. Somebody might say, well, I didn't think Job had anything wrong with him. From the Bible description, it would seem that Job was troubled with that terrible sin of pride, that thing within his life seemed to help bring on the suffering that he experienced. But God delivered him. Then we look at David, the sweet singer of Israel. David that wrote over 50 of the Psalms. David, a man after God's own heart. The first human name in the New Testament is David. The last human name in the New Testament is David. Jesus is called the son of David. That thing within his life, the Holy Spirit did not see fit to cover it up. He brought it out in the open. David became the song of the drunkards. This man that was the greatest theocratic example that, that, that God ever set upon a throne. David, the sweet psalmist, the sweet singer of Israel. But the sin of which I spoke of tonight was rampant within his heart. It went even worse. It was the sin of a, adultery and the sin of murder. That thing. David the mighty king, Bathsheba, the beautiful lady. Two people plunged into a holocaust of sin and a whole nation staggered under the impact of it and a baby lay dying. Jacob. There was very little difference in Jacob and Esau. You would be hard put to find Jacob a better man than Esau in the beginning. To be frank and honest with you, it would seem that Esau might have been the better man. The very name Jacob means deceiver and surplanner. He acted out the part. It was his very nature. Jacob, that thing within his life to deceive that almost destroyed the plan of God for the human race. You hear him as he cries in the book of Genesis. As he wrestled all night long and said, I will not let thee go until thou bless me. Jacob was tired of that thing within his life, making his existence curvy and twisty. Jacob said, I must be delivered. I must be changed. And God Almighty, after a night of wrestling, changed him. You can be changed. I'm here to tell you that you don't have to live under that rod of hell. I'm here to tell you tonight that that bondage can be broken and it actually was broken by Jesus Christ at Calvary 2,000 years ago.
Satan will tell you it's impossible. You fasted. You've been anointed with oil. The preacher praying for you did not know the problem. God did not choose to reveal it to him. But you've tried everything you know. But that bondage is there. But I'm here to tell you tonight that you can be free. This very message that is being preached to you, not only here, but by television, this word can set you free. While I'm preaching tonight, Satan has told you it's hopeless, it's, it's no use, it cannot be. You've tried everything, it's gone on for years and years and years. But I'm here to tell you tonight, God knows about it. God can set you free, He can break the chain. You can be free from that bondage of hell and that bondage of darkness, that thing. Joshua was made free from it. The high priest. You can read about it in Zechariah. He was given a change of clothing for his garments were filthy. That thing within his life caused this man that was a leader to be filthy in the eyes of God. But God changed him. You can be clean. Sin cannot have dominion over you if you believe it. But listen to me. Don't wait too late. You can wait too late. You can wait so late until the mercy of God, even though it endureth forever, you have gone beyond its pale. You can wait too late until catastrophe and chaos overtakes you and you are destroyed. Some of you that sit in this audience tonight, maybe. Some of you that watch the television, that thing in your life has been there for years. And I want to tell you this, even though God will forgive you and have mercy and patience and love and long-suffering with you, you will never know His fullness with that thing in your life. You will have to live off the offspring of others as the vision was given to my friend. Others may look at you never dreaming of what lurks beneath your heart. And I do not say that condemnatory. They may ask you, how are you? And you may, you may say, all is well and everything is fine. But inside, you know it's that thing. It, it's been there for so long. But you can wait too long, too late. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 20, the Word of God tells us this. Jesus is speaking to the church. He is not speaking to the unsaved. He's speaking to the church. Revelation chapter 2, verse 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. It's talking to the church now. Because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Notice what he said in the 21st verse. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication. And she repented not. I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation except they repent of their deeds and I will kill her children with death. This woman waited too late. Space was given to repent. She did not. You look at Achan. Achan, the victory had been glorious with Joshua. Jericho had fallen. AI was just a stop in the road. A small expeditionary force was sent against it. But lo and behold, Israel was defeated and 37 men died. Joshua went before God and said, what has happened? And God pointed it out, the very tribe, the very man, Achan. He had stolen the Babylonian garment, the silver, the gold. The thing had been in his heart, that thing. He wept, he cried, he repented, but it was too late. You hear me? It was too late. 
You look at Esau. Esau wept bitterly with tears. The birthright that he did not consider had no regard for. The Bible said that Esau was a fornicator. This, among other things in his life, that thing destroyed him. And there came a time that he did weep bitterly, but it was too late. Saul. A lot of folk don't realize it, but Saul was a mighty man. Saul would have made a great king. Saul had tremendous military ability. But Saul had that thing of pride within his life. And you hear his awful words, I have sinned and I have played the fool. That thing destroyed him. He wept. He asked for help, but it was too late. I don't guess this would be complete tonight were I not to speak of Judas. Judas that walked with Jesus. Judas that saw so much of the power of God. Judas that came so close, but that thing was in his life. You see, you can be right in the church, rubbing shoulders with a preacher, or involved in the ministry, so very, very close as Judas was, but that thing was in his life. I will always believe if Judas had gone to Jesus and begged forgiveness and begged mercy as Simon Peter did, he would have been forgiven. But he wept, he cried, he said, I've sinned, that I've I've betrayed innocent blood. But it was too late. Too late. You can wait too late. I had a dear, dear friend some years ago. I'll call him Smith. His name was not that. But so as not to embarrass anyone, I'll use that name. A church was built in his area. His entire family knew nothing of God knew nothing of the grace of God, knew nothing of the power of God to say they attended a church, but knew nothing of Jesus, really. They lived hard, sinned hard, drank hard, gambled, profane, vulgarity, you name it. But a church was built that believed in and preached the power of God. Something had happened in that community before that church was built. One of those brothers, not the man of which I speak, but his brother, very close to one of his relations, actually a first cousin. Almost every week they would get drunk together. They would oftentimes get in arguments and a fight would ensue. But after the liquor wore off, they were still the best of friends. They were inseparable. One night, the argument was more heated than usual. One of the men, the man followed his friend home, cursing him. This had happened many times, but it was to a greater degree. Satan can maneuver you into a trap. He wants to destroy you. The man walked into his house, pulled a double-barrel shotgun from the side of the wall, walked out on the front porch, leveled it at his closest and dearest friend, both drunk. The man stood there and dared him to pull the trigger, inebriated, not knowing what he was saying. The man pulled both triggers and blew his stomach all over the road. He died in front of his wife, in front of his children. When the judge sentenced that man to prison, those brothers, it was five of them. Now one was dead, four left. Those four brothers sat there, powerful men. Two of them were six feet, six inches tall. One 285 pounds, the other 290 pounds, bone and muscle. The judge said to that man, if you ever get out of jail, 
If you ever get out of prison and you come back to this country, those men there will kill you and there's not a thing I can do about it. Don't you ever come back. He went to prison. He'd just been released on parole when the church was built. These men hired professional gunmen. They blew the windshield out of his car. They came close to killing him several times. Many times I would see one of them and he would have a 38 in the waistband of his trousers. If they heard this man was anywhere, they would go there to kill him. They were eaten up with that thing called vengeance. Hate was cutting their life out. One of those brothers got saved, the first one that came to Jesus. His brother heard about it, the one of my story. I'll call him Bob. He came to the church, never been in anything like it before in his life. The Spirit of God dealt with him greatly. He would not yield. On his mind, 24 hours a day with his other brothers was to kill the man that murdered their brother. He walked out of that church under deep conviction. I was there that night. I saw him. Powerful man. Six feet, six inches tall. But all that weak Holy Ghost conviction worked on him. You see, this is what makes television so powerful. Those of you watching me, you've been comfortable in your sin. You've been comfortable in your drinking. You've been comfortable in your, your gambling, your fornication, your cheating, the way you've been living. But, but you've, you've been sitting and you've been watching and observing and viewing these telecasts week after week. And something's working on you in your heart. You're not the same anymore. It doesn't bring the pleasure the sin doesn't that it once brought. You, you go with the boys and you throw the cards on the table but you leave after a few hands you, you you drink your beer but now it's stale to your tongue you go into a no dirty movie you sit there for 20 minutes and you get up you don't know what's wrong with you i'll tell you what's wrong with you you've been exposed to the gospel of jesus christ and the holy ghost conviction is touching your heart we're not playing a game of spiritual tiddlywinks this is not some, some spiritual gymnastics that we're going through. This is a matter of life and death. This is a matter of eternity. I'm not up here for my health or to see or be seen. I'm here to preach the Word of God and it is a powerful Word. You will never be the same again after you hear it. Never again. I get the letters by the thousands. I receive them as wives or husbands or son or daughter or mother or dad write me and say my husband or my son or my wife or whomever it will be is not saved. And they watch you every Sunday and they are under deep conviction. They walk away from that television set saying I'll never look at it again. But the next Sunday they are back looking at it again because of the drawing power of the Spirit of God. Do you know what's happening? I'll tell you what's happening. It's God's Spirit. He knows that you're headed for hell. He knows you're one breath from the pit and He's trying to stop you. He's trying to reach you. He's trying to get you with a hand of love and mercy. That's the reason it's so important. Listen to me, saints of God. Listen to me, preachers, that our churches be more than glorified social clubs. It's so important that our choirs be more than exhibitions of talent. It's so important uh, that we exhibit a life of consecration and dedication. For let Jimmy Swagger tell you this, uh, the only hope of a lost and dying world is the love of God and the power of God and the grace of God through your life uh, to the lives of those that are not saved. One man said the other day, a multimillionaire, conversing with one of my associates, he said, I was in a 
hotel room in California. Jimmy Swaggart came over that Sunday morning and pointed his finger through that TV screen and said, you there in that motel room, you're rich, but you're miserable and you're, you're, you don't know what to do. You're, 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 you're living in total, absolute misery. He said, I sat there and shook all over. Thought, my God, he's reading my mind. It wasn't me, it was the Holy Ghost. It was the Holy Ghost. He left that church all week long. He was on the police force in his city, and he, he couldn't sleep. And that weekend came, and he asked his wife, is there a church here like it was in our, in our where I went last week? Never been to anything like that in my life. She looked in the yellow pages of the phone book and said, I think I remember the name, and if it is, and I'm right, there's one here. He said, get ready, we're going. It was Sunday night. They went, five children with them. They were in revival. Preacher preached on the prodigal son. Big Bob was the first one up. <laughs> Hallelujah, went to Jesus. Jesus cleansed him and washed him and washed away the stain of sin. But that thing was still there. Time and time again, he would sit down before me and my dad, and he would say, God delivered me from a fifth of scotch a day, three packs of cigarettes a day, womanizing, skirt chasing, adultery, fornication. My marriage vows, I broke them with impunity. God delivered me from the lust and the rot and the filth, but I don't know what I will do if I ever lay eyes on the man that murdered my brother in cold blood. One Friday night, he was at the parsonage. Came around to tell my dad, he said, I can't teach the Sunday school class in the morning. I have to leave out of town to attend to business. I'll be gone the entire weekend. And he left. Saturday morning about 9 o'clock, strangely, I saw his car. I happened to be over at the parsonage. I'd gone over to my dad's for something early that Saturday morning. I remembered that Bob had said that he would not be there, he would be out of town, but there was his car driving up. I watched him out of the window. He jumped out of the car, never even killed the engine, left the door open, came bounding up the steps, hit on it a couple of times and came in. Big man, powerful man. He was weeping, he was crying, not tears of sorrow or, or pathos or rejection or rebellion or heartache, but tears of joy. He was pacing the floor back and forth and, and he was raising his hands, praising God. And I was sitting there and my dad looking at him, what is it? What has happened? He said, victory, victory, victory. I said, I said, Bob, what, what is it? You were supposed to be out of town. He said, I know, but my plans were changed. Early this morning, I couldn't go. He said, I got in my car, and I, I rode over to a relative's house. I saw a strange car there, he said. Thought little of it. Walked around to the back. Rung the doorbell. A voice said, come in. And he said, I opened the door, and when I opened it, right in my line of village, uh, line of vision was the man that had pointed a double-barrel shotgun at my brother while his children and his wife looked on and in drunkenness pulled both triggers and killed my brother. The man had heard he would be out of town, had hardly come in to transact some business and was going to leave out before Bob returned. But plans had been changed, unbeknowing to anyone. And here Bob was face to face with him. And I said, Bob, what happened? He said, Brother Jimmy, I, I looked at him. Something rose up in me and said, kill him. 
They had lived this and dreamed it and paid thousands of dollars to professional gunmen to kill him. And here he was. Big Bob, six feet, six inches, had fought in the Battle of the Bulge in Germany at the close of World War II. He had killed men with his bare hand. That's how powerful he was. Something said, kill him. The man turned deathly pale and staggered back up against the wall. And the lady there, the cousin of both of them, said, oh my God. But he said, Brother Jimmy, I sobbed it out. Jesus, help me. And a peace, he said, came over me. Hallelujah. That covered the hate, that rolled back that thing that had been there and had destroyed the whole families. And he said, it was like something that just completely covered me. The rage left. And instead of a fist, he said it was an outstretched hand. He said, I walked over to him. And he was standing there trembling, the man was. And he said, I got his hand and said, the past is gone. You need have no fear of me. I've been saved by the blood of Jesus. <laughs> Glory to God. He said, Jimmy Swaggart, we put our arms around each other. I pulled him close and he sobbed on my shoulder. Only the love of God could put something together like that. But he stood up to his full height, tears rolling down his cheeks in that living room in that little town those years ago and said, that thing is whipped in my life. It's whipped. It's whipped. Be it jealousy or vengeance or hate or rebellion or sexual uncleanliness or filth or secret drinking or drugs, that thing will destroy you, but Jesus can set you free tonight. Would you bow your heads, please? How many in this auditorium tonight of several thousands of people? Jimmy Swaggart, that thing in my life is, as you said, getting worse and worse. I can't go on any longer with it. God has spoken to my heart tonight. I must be free. How many would slip up your hand? It'll take courage to do it, but you better do it. Raise it high quickly. Slip it up on the main floor. How many right now? I see it. Thank you. Thank you. Up in the bleachers, how many would raise your hands, please? Pray for me. Pray for me. Pray for me. God love your heart. Raise them. I'm not going to spend much time. Jimmy Swaggart, that thing is in my life. I don't want to go on any longer with it. I see those hands. Way up in the top, how many of you would raise your hands? I want everyone to stand, please, in this entire auditorium. I'm going to ask Carol to sing Unworthy of the Blood. While she is singing this, I want every one of you that raised your hands I want you to step out tonight, walk down these aisles, 
and say, God, I can't stand it anymore. I'm coming home. This thing has got to be broken. It's got to be broken. As she sings it and the Spirit of God deals with you, some of you may stand there and say, but Brother Swaggart, what will people think? You'd better forget about what people think and realize what God knows and what the devil's trying to do to you. He's trying to destroy you. Come, sing it, Carol. We'll wait for you from the top of the balcony. Come. So unworthy of the blood. Oh God. Oh dear God. Sing that chorus again, Carol. Sing it again. Spirit of God moves, come sing the second verse, please. Just one more time. They're still coming. They're still coming. Here am I, so unworthy of the blood, so unworthy Just lift up your hands and let His presence flow through you. Let it flow into your heart. Let the blood cleanse every stain. It can cleanse every stain tonight. It can break every chain and every fetter by the power of Almighty God. Glory be to the Lamb. I want every saint of God in this building believing God with me this moment. Believe God with me this moment. Let the word, the anointing that breaks the yoke, set you free. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Glory to God. I am going to pray for these right now that are here and those of you that are watching me by television. While I'm praying for them, I will be praying for you. The blood of Jesus Christ through his word and the anointing of the Holy Ghost, for the word says the anointing breaks the yoke. 
you can be free tonight, totally and completely. Many of you are already free, but as I pray right now, with calm confidence and faith in God, put your total confidence in Him. He will set you free. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so very much. I would pray tonight for everyone that stands before me, not only here in Dallas, but also those by television. Satan has lied to them. He has told them it's hopeless. They have tried over and over and over and over again. And it's been failure and defeat and defeat and failure. But tonight something happened while we were preaching. <laughs> the anointing broke the yoke. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Simon Peter will no longer be a reed shaken with the wind, but he will be a rock. Glory. Jacob will no longer be the deceiver and the surplanter, but he will be Israel, the prince of God. Joshua will, win, will no longer be the tainted priest clothed in filthy garments. But he will stand in the righteousness of God. Isaiah will no longer cry unclean, unclean. For his iniquity and sin is washed away. And you have cleansed David by your blood. <laughs> And washed him that he is clean. And I'm believing you that multiple thousands, not only here in Dallas, but by television, have been cleansed and made free. And that thing is broken now and forever within their lives. It is done. In the name of Jesus, it is done. Sin shall not have dominion. Sin shall not have dominion. Sin shall not have dominion. Now look at Brother Swagger just for a moment, please. I want you to remember this. In the eyes of God tonight, you are as clean in His eyes as the blood of His Son, Jesus, can make you. Whatever the past was, it is that past. And it's in the seas of God's forgetfulness, never to be remembered against you no more. Secondly, walk in His love and His grace according to His word, and sin will not have dominion over you, for that thing is broken in your life. Gone, broken completely in Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord. Some few of you standing here tonight are not saved, and I'm going to pray the sinner's prayer. You're at the very edge. The door is wide open. There are no hindrances now. The lights of that city are ahead. We're going to pray the sinner's prayer, and I want you to repeat it out loud after me and believe it with all of your heart. Believe it with all of your heart, and you will be saved. I promise that. Bow your heads, please. Close your eyes. Now let us pray. Dear Heavenly, Father, Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you, I come to you in, Jesus sweet name. in Jesus' sweet name. I'm sorry for my sins, I'm sorry for my sins and the way I've lived. And the way I live. Please, forgive me. Please forgive me. Cleanse me with your precious blood, me with your precious blood. from all unrighteousness. You said in your holy word, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. And with my mouth, according to your word, I confess Jesus Christ. In my heart, I believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. And he lives. I put my hopes in him. My past, my present, and my future. 
I give it to Jesus. Right now, I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. I will live for him, trust him, serve him, and according to his holy word, through nothing I've done, but what he has done. I am saved. Hallelujah. It's done. Praise the name of Jesus. I'm going to thank you, Lord, for saving.